So now we can compute uh, minimum distances and uh, this allows us already to solve quite a few applications that would be challenging if we, if we didn't have this capability to compute uh, uh, projections of, of minimum norm. Um, the first example I want to show you here uh, has the, the, <laughs> the interesting name of eigenfaces. And uh, what we'll do here, and uh, this we will also look at in the exercises, here we will be catching bad guys. So imagine you are um, at the police and you are taking mug shots of gangsters. So the gangsters are arriving and you're taking a picture of them and they have to look into the camera and they cannot smile. And, uh, and maybe the gangster is lying to you and is not giving uh, you his real name. Now, how can you find out who this person actually is? Uh, oftentimes, the police will have a database of all the past mugshots and maybe also uh, can, can, can uh, knows about uh, people that were arrested in previous years or in other cities and so on. And they want to know whether this guy was already arrested. And uh, for that, in the past, they just had to um, go over long lists of pictures. And uh, with computers today, it, uh, it can be, it can be uh, aided. There can be some assistance by the computer. And uh, the eigenfaces, they are actually quite old. So today we have very fancy methods and very performant methods to, um, uh, to, to, to compare faces. Um, but in the 80s, we uh, were doing this with uh, the eigenfaces method. Um, but now we have to get back to the question of, of projection and uh, minimum norms. So what is happening is that uh, we basically have a basis that consists of, how to say, feature prototypes. Uh, we have, this, is the, this is the average phase. Uh, so we have the average phase um, that is the result of just looking at, at hundreds and thousands of, of phase images and computing this average phase. So uh, initially, we are, we are removing the average phase. So we, uh, we, we want to consider at the particularities uh, that go beyond just the average phase. And, um, and then we have the eigenfaces. So this will be here E1 and E2 and so on. Uh, these are then the eigenfaces. And what we want to achieve is we want to reconstruct the, the image that we have by projecting on the vector space spanned by the eigenfaces. And the way these eigenfaces are initially created, it uh, depends on this eigen decomposition technique that we already saw for uh, computing Fibonacci in, in constant time. We will not look at what the eigen decomposition does. We just assume that we have a couple of well, funny faces somehow um, uh, from which we can reconstruct the actual faces. And by taking the weighted sum of the eigenfaces and then adding back the average face. Uh, and so we have uh, the actual picture. So here somehow we have the actual picture of the guy and he's not smiling. So here we have a face. And uh, what we want to do is we want to take the actual picture that we have and find the projection to the space of the eigenfaces um, that is closest to it. So here we then also have to define a, a distance uh, or, or an, an inner product and then uh, we can do that. And um, the big advantage is that um, we can now um, describe every phase with a low dimensional number of descriptors. Because now we have this alpha 1 to alpha n, maybe we have a hundred different eigenfaces. And then when the gangster comes in, we can describe his face with uh, a hundred dimensional vector. And all the other faces in our database, 
we can also describe them with a hundred dimensional vector. And this now allows us to do uh, efficient, for example, nearest neighbor lookup and to, 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 to look at uh, maybe uh, candidates. The system gives us candidates and then uh, we can compare and, and figure out whether maybe uh, this, this person from the mugshot is actually um, um, in, in the database already. And uh, the technology to do that, it's now uh, more than 30 years old. Uh, today it's a lot more advanced, uh, but uh, here um, why we are, we are taking this example here is uh, because it shows some of the power and that uh, even quite high dimensional um, entries of a, of a vector space um, or high dimensional vector spaces um, can be uh, useful and that we can efficiently uh, compute this projection for them and uh, in the exercises we will actually implement such a system where we can uh, figure out if a person on an image is already in, in our database. Okay, now uh, let's switch gears. Let's take another example and uh, also an example that shows what we can do by uh, looking at uh, or by designing um, a, a, an inner product uh, that um, uh, helps us solve an, an actual optimization problem. So what we want to do here is we want to approximate the sine function with a polynomial function. So the sine function uh, it is actually difficult for the computer to work with a sine function because in many places when I evaluate the sine function uh, I could get uh, infinitely many digits. So um, um, the, the computer who gives us or who computes sine in finite time only gives us an approximation. And uh, now what I'm asking here is whether I can approximate sine uh, with a polynomial. So again, a polynomial is just, um, um, let's say I have uh, C1 plus C1 times X plus C, or C2 times X plus C3 times X squared plus C4 times X to the third power. And, and, and so on. So I'm looking at the polynomials here with respect to, to x. And um, uh, well, the question is how should I select the, the weights, the c, uh, in order uh, for this to approximate the sine function as closely as possible. And uh, well, we already see here some of the results that we will recreate shortly. So now um, here we have um, the sine approximated by a second order polynomial, uh, or it's not actually sine, um, it is actually g of t, which is uh, the, the sine of pi times t. So here this should be g, and this here should also be g. And uh, so we, um, we see here already that the second degree uh, polynomial, it's not a good approximation at all. Uh, so here we have we have a lot of, of error uh, and it's, it's directly visible to the naked eye. It's not a good approximation. However, when we go to uh, the fifth degree or the fourth degree polynomial, um, uh, we see that it's already much closer and uh, uh, it's, it's still not perfect, but to the naked eye it already looks Quite close. And uh, so how can we compute these uh, weights? How can we compute the actual coefficients of the, of the polynomial? Um, and uh, this is actually also a projection that we are doing. Now again look at the or consider the vector space L2 that contains all the continuous functions. Um, and now, the, so these are all the functions from uh, between 0 and 1 or with a, with a domain zero, between 0 and 1 that are mapping to, to the real numbers. Um, and um, with the added 
uh, with the added constraint that if I now take the integral between 0 and 1 of uh, ft squared um, for this f, uh, my function, this has to be smaller than infinity. So this is just a, one of the side constraints of this, of this L2 norm, so that the, the inner product that we are looking at makes sense. Okay, and now we have the inner product uh, between f and g, uh, between 0 and 1, I multiply f and g. Um, by taking the integral between 0 and 1 and for every, at every point, multiplying the two. Okay, and uh, we have a corresponding norm to that, which is just the inner product uh, of f with itself and taking the square root of that. Okay, so this is the uh, first ingredient that we need. So this is just uh, the vector space L2. And uh, obviously, sine is an element of L2. Yeah? So the sine function, or rather this g function here, but also sine, so here g of t, it's an element of this vector space. Okay, now another vector space that um, uh, we need to consider is the vector space of all the polynomials of nth degree. Or this is rather the, the space of polynomials um, of up to nth degree, because I can just set some of the coefficients as zero. So the polynomials of fifth degree include also all the polynomials of fourth degree and so on. Okay, and um, I can represent every polynomial uh, by an n, n, nth degree polynomial by an n plus one vector, so with n plus one elements, uh, because I also have to uh, consider the intercept. So here this first element uh, has also be, has to be considered. So the second degree polynomials, uh, I need uh, three real numbers to, to describe it. Okay. And uh, any set of polynomial functions uh, spans a subspace of L2. Uh, and if these polynomial functions are now linearly independent, aha, now we have to think about what does it mean for functions to be linear, linearly independent. Um, they span a subspace of, of L2. Right? And uh, we can even compute an orthonormal basis for it. Now, um, first of all, uh, let's look at let's look at p3, and let's look at a couple of uh, elements of p3 that we could use as the basis. For example, here we could have now um, calling it uh, b1. So b1 of t is just one. So that could be an example. Uh, or b2 of t is t. This is all, these are all now uh, elements of, the, uh, of P3. And um, I can now use the uh, Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization method to compute um, an orthonormal basis for that. Okay. So um, we have our vector space L2 and we have a subspace of that with all the polynomials. And now when I choose some element, for example, the sine function or this g of t, which is a modified sine function, um, it looks a little bit better in, in, in the plots. Um, then the question is, um, which of the polynomials is closest to the sine function or is closest to g? Yeah. So now here we are looking of fn looking for fn, which is the polynomial of up to nth degree, that is closest to this g function according to the, to the norm uh, from the inner product up here. Okay. And um, um, let's uh, see how we could do this in Julia. And it's all, uh, it's all fitting on a single slide, so it's, it's actually not so much code. 
First of all, we need in Julia to define the polynomials. So, and the polynomials are just a, a structure that contains a, a vector of float 64 uh, with all the coefficients. Yeah? So, if I had a fourth degree polynomial, I would put here a, a vector with five elements. And now, when I'm evaluating the polynomial at a, uh, at a certain point x, then I just uh, go over the coefficients and, uh, and uh, take my x and take the, the corresponding power of x. Um, so here the first, first I would take x to the zeros power, uh, which would be 1, and uh, multiply that with the intercept and then go on by looping over all the elements of my uh, coefficient vector. Okay, so just with uh, four lines I can define uh, polynomials and, and how to evaluate polynomials. What I then need in addition is addition and subtraction. So here I'm overloading um, my uh, addition operator uh, and specializing it for uh, two polynomials as the input. Uh, the same for subtraction. And then I need multiplication and division with a scalar number. It's the same. I'm overloading the operator and uh, defining multiplication for, for polynomials with a scalar. And now I can uh, evaluate that. So for example, the polynomial of uh, here, this would be um, um, 1 plus 2x plus 0 times x squared. And I can evaluate that at the point uh, 2.0 and I get out 5, which is what I expected. And now I can also multiply polynomials and add them, uh, multiply with a scalar and add polynomials together. So this, the entire thing on this page here, this is just vector space stuff. Right? And it doesn't yet have anything to do with, uh, with uh, norm spaces or Hilbert spaces and so on. But now I'm adding um, the definition of the inner product. So here, now here we are in Hilbert space territory. because now I'm defining the inner product. And uh, just um, the way it was defined on the previous slide with the integral, uh, but here I'm taking a shortcut. I'm approximating the integral um, by having a, a very, very small discretization or discretization with some, some small number. And uh, now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking the sum and, uh, but this is the usual method on, on how uh, an integral would be, would be approximated. It's actually very close to what we saw with the Euler method in the previous lectures. Okay, now I have a vector space equipped with an inner product. And that's all I need. Now I just have to... Um, um, uh, oh, and what is important, so this is the vector space um, of polynomials. Of polys, and this guy over here, this is the Hilbert space L2. And um, what I can now say is I take an element of the Hilbert space, which is here the GT, and I want to project this on a basis um, from the uh, or on, on a basis. Uh, from the space of polynomials. So here, this is the space of, of polynomials. Okay, and I can just plug that in. So the previous definition of the normal equations, it works exactly the way uh, one would expect. Now I just have to use a, a different here, a special value type for, for the norm, so that the type inference uh, works correctly. And then everything will be figured out automatically. Now I'm taking this function g as input and projecting it on the basis p. And uh, it will actually return to me now the coefficients of the uh, approximation that we saw on the previous slide. So here we had zero, minus 0 0.05 plus something plus something. And uh, this is actually uh, what is returned here. Now, what is interesting is that your computer can only approximate the sine function to some precision. And how does your computer actually do that? 
he uh, either has an implementation in hardware with uh, all kinds of, of lookup tables and so on, or he has an implementation in software, typically provided by the standard math library of your operating system or, or a libnm if you're in, in Unix or Linux world. And now if we look at the different implementations of the sign function provided, um, so you have the GNU standard library that also comes with the math functions um, or some other ones, uh, for example the netlib um, library is, is one of the original open source implementations of all the mathematical uh, well, well, standard functions that you need, uh, they actually approximate the sine function with a polynomial. So there's a good chance that your computer, if you call sine of something, internally will uh, um, run a, a polynomial or evaluate a polynomial to get uh, to approximate sine. And the coefficients of this poly polynomial have been uh, originally found by exactly the, the methods that we saw here. Maybe they were a, a little bit smarter even in the definition of the, uh, of the, of the inner product they wanted to use. Um, 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 but uh, here uh, we saw the, the one approach where we actually um, um, compute with uh, continuous functions and uh, we immediately see how this applies and how this goes to, to, to the core of what our computer is doing in, uh, in, 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 numerical, um, in numerical problems that, that use trigonometry. Okay, now um, one further example here and uh, now we are getting closer and closer to optimization problems. Uh, or optimization problems in the way we have saw, seen them in, in previous lectures is uh, here the optimization of a quadratic with equality constraints. So we have a um, uh, we have an optimization problem where we want to minimize um, x transposed times matrix Q times x, where the Q um, matrix here has to be positive definite uh, in order for the entire thing to be uh, convex. And in addition we have um, uh, uh, an inequality constraint similar to what we had already seen in the past. And actually this guy here it can be represented also as a norm minimization. Uh, but first let's build up a little bit more machinery that we need. Now um, the AX times b, the ax equals b uh, equality here. This actually constrains our solution to lie on what we call a linear variety. So we had seen the linear variety uh, in, the, in, in the quiz earlier. And uh, here we see v. So for all, for all uh, uh, little v in big v, we have um, a v equals b and uh, this is a linear variety because there exists a, uh, a vector space uh, that crosses the, the zero, the null vector, because every vector space has to cross the null vector or include the null vector, uh, but we can um, um, uh, offset this, uh, this uh, vector space here in order to, to get the, the linear variety B. Okay, so that's the first thing that we notice. And uh, the second thing is that the, um, that the function um, um, x transpose qx, uh, it is actually a valid inner product. So, um, um, well, actually for the inner product here, we would have note that x inner product y, yeah, this would be, this would be the inner product. And then we can also have a norm for that. So um, then the, the, the norm for that um, would be then x with the inner product uh, or with itself. Uh, 
Okay, and um, now we can ask the question um, um, in order to, to, to solve this guy up here, this optimization up here, uh, what we're actually asking, which element of V is closest to the null vector with respect to the distance metric or the norm um, for, for, for this inner product. So this is just a different way of, of stating the same, the same problem. And uh, the way we solve that is, first of all, we, we look for any v, uh, any small v, that fulfills the constraint a v equals b. Uh, so this is an arbitrary v that fulfills this constraint. And uh, what we then do is we translate, um, we find first of all the, the space uh, big H, uh, that is the translation of v so that it crosses the null vector. And here we just compute the null space of A, of the matrix A, and uh, take the result as the, the basis that spans this uh, H, H tilde. Um, and, um, well, how we compute the null space, we already saw how, how to do that in Julia. Okay, and, um, uh, well, this uh, H then is equipped also with our special inner product uh, with this Q here. And uh, with, with standards methods that we already saw, um, we can now project the V onto, onto H tilde. So here uh, we have this projection going down here. Okay. And now we saw, we see a certain distance of this H to the null vector. So here we have this distance. And uh, what we now do is we apply this distance, or here, uh, uh, well, the, here, this is actually h. And now we are moving our original v. And here, this is actually the same vector. Yeah? So here, this is my h. And now I'm removing h from my original v. And this gives me my point x star that, uh, um, lies on this linear variety and is closest to the null vector. Uh, and this has like an angle because of, of the Q that was chosen. Um, if, uh, if Q uh, contained or if Q was the identity matrix, then uh, X star would lie exactly on the, on, the, on the arrow that you see here to indicate one of, one of the dimensions. Okay, um, so for this, special type of optimization problem, we could now compute a closed form solution. Uh, so we didn't have to use iterative methods like uh, gradient descent of the Newton method, but we actually had a closed form solution, uh, which is great, uh, which is actually what, what we, the best that we can hope for is to find a closed form solution. And uh, by being clever, we can also try to, to uh, use uh, sparsity in, in the queue where it exists and, and make this somehow efficient. And um, there are even a couple of interesting applications that take exactly this form. And uh, one of them is the layout of a C of gates chip. Uh, so uh, a C of gates is um, one method for uh, producing uh, processors or, or microchips. Um, so there are two extreme solutions or there are two extreme methods on the spectrum. So you can have FPGAs where the FPGA is rather expensive but it's also very flexible uh, because you can just upload uh, logic and on the other end of the spectrum, you have the ASICs, so the, the, the real, the, the silicon that is custom made for, for a, a certain uh, functionality. And somewhere in between, you have this sea of gates option uh, where a lot of structure is already imposed. Um, 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 but the, and you will produce chips that only have uh, the functionality that you give it, but it's uh, still a lot cheaper to produce than the ASICs because uh, there's like a, a predefined uh, 
uh, matrix of, of transistors and you only define uh, where to put a connection and where not to put a connection. So it's not freely programmable like an FPGA, but it is more structured than uh, an, an ASIC. And you use that if you produce a couple of thousand of chips where the FPGA is not uh, cost effective, but where you also don't want to uh, do the full lithography for, 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 for an ASIC. Okay, so C of gates is one way to produce computer chips and uh, you want to optimize the topology of that, you want to uh, save space and also you want to, uh, uh, to shorten the connections that you have between transistors. And, um, but you have some constraints, so we have some constraints because here we have these I.O. pads uh, on the outside. And uh, so given these constraints, we want to minimize the, uh, the, the length of the, of, the, of the connections between the transistors. And this gives us uh, exactly a quadratic optimization problem with equality constraints. And if someday you are producing uh, a computer chip and want to use C of gates, then with high probability you will be using quite expensive software for the, for the tape out. And to, when you press the button, it will solve this type of optimization problem and, and, and give you the exact topology of the chip. Okay, so again, one more uh, application example. Um, oh, what, is, what is important here for this application example to consider is the closed form solution, it only works when we have exactly the form that we show here. Uh, if we are now adding one additional uh, linear factor, so here if we have an additional, um, um, how to call it, let's say small r, transposed x. Um, um, the optimization literature would still call this a quadratic optimization problem, but it, uh, it uh, does not allow the, the closed form solution of this um, minimum norm projection. Okay, and now the, the last application example is conjugate gradient. Conjugate gradient um, is very closely related to, to gradient descent, but we have one additional uh, step, processing step of, for the gradient before we apply it. Uh, we make the gradient orthogonal to the previous steps. So here there's a, a picture to show that the usual gradient descent uh, would be here in green and we zigzag along until we get to, to, to the target and we might take uh, quite a few zigzags. And uh, on the other hand here with the conjugate gradient method, um, we only have one zig. Um, and uh, so depending on the, on the norm that is in, in, in place here, uh, this here would be the two gradient steps would be orthogonal to each other. And if we are in a higher dimensional space, then um, I want to be orthogonal to all previous gradients um, until I run out of my dimensions and then uh, I, can, I can restart. Okay, um, so gradient descent, I compute the gradient, I orthogonalize it with um, the, uh, the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization method, and then I, I apply an additional line search where specialized line searches exist that exploit a little more of well, structure. Um, and uh, what is nice here, that if I have a quadratic optimization problem with n dimensions, then I know that I only need n steps for conjugate gradient to get to the result. Um, so the Newton method would solve this quadratic problem in a single step, but I need to evaluate the Hessian and uh, solve a linear equation for it. And uh, in general, uh, I can achieve some speed ups with conjugate gradient and conjugate gradient oftentimes also works nicely if I am not in a quadratic but more complicated uh, optimization setting. Um, one little anecdote to, to wrap this up is uh, Hestenes um, uh, worked on this in, in the 40s and 50s. And uh, back then they worked at the SUSE Z4 computer. So probably you heard about SUSE and the, like the German lineage of, of the first uh, computers that were developed. And uh, these were not only theoretical or somewhere in a garage, but people did actual work with them. 
so they, they had one of the zoos in, uh, in Zurich at the ETH University and there uh, they developed uh, things like uh, the Algol programming language which is the granddaddy of, of many operating languages uh, programming languages we use today and they also developed a uh, conjugate gradient on the on the SUSE Z4 computer back in the day. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned about vector spaces and the different axioms that vector spaces or that have to be fulfilled in order for something to be a vector space. We learned about norms, uh, norms that go beyond Euclidean uh, distances and, um, and, and Banach spaces which are uh, vector spaces equipped with a norm that are also complete. Then Hilbert spaces. Hilbert spaces are then adding the notion of orthogonality with the inner product and uh, this orthogonality can be used uh, for minimum norm projection by making use of the, uh, of the corresponding theorems and uh, we have the Gram-Schmidt algorithm and the normal equations in order to, to compute this minimum norm projection and uh, we can do this in the usual geometric vector spaces uh, but also um, uh, for example in, 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 in function spaces. Okay and uh, with this we saw a lot of applications for minimum norm projection so we saw uh, how we can uh, catch bad guys or compare mugshots uh, with the eigenfaces, uh, how to approximate the sine function uh, by computing a polynomial that is, is very close to the sine function and uh, so here we had a minimum norm projection on, on a function space. Uh, we saw how to solve a quadratic optimization problem with equality constraints and how to solve it in a closed form. And uh, we saw conjugate gradient which is an iterative method that also uh, well uses uh, orthogonality between the, 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 the steps that we take in order to speed up the optimization. That's it for today and uh, see you next week for lecture 8 and uh, lecture 8 will be on duality so more fun results to follow next week. See you then.